hello and welcome to my channel. So here's the deal. This video I kind of wanted to talk about a name that some of you may have heard in the 90s, some of you may have heard in the late 80s, some of you may have never heard of it all, but at one point there was a company called Cyrix and they were the third party. Everyone knows that there's a Team Blue and Team Red, at least those of us in the tech space. For those of us not, that would be Intel and AMD. Intel, well, their story is pretty rich and they have a long history of innovation, of cutting edge, of expensive bleeding edge technology sort of carrying from generation to generation. And AMD, they started out manufacturing Intel clones and now with Dr. Lisa Su as CEO, they're at top of the world. They're the ones with Ryzen 5000 leading the pack while Intel is slowly catching up. But right now, none of that matters because we're not here to talk about the quintessential duo that sort of rules the tech space. We're here to talk about the third party, the supposed Team Green, Cyrix Corporation. If you're more interested in some gameplay, benchmarks, and some sound tests, feel free to click on the timestamp below and I'll bring you right to where you want to be. So anyway, what even is Cyrix? Well, in 1988, Jerry Rogers and Tom Brightman formed Cyrix Corporation, a small company with a design team that eventually reached 30 people to manufacture math coprocessors for 286 and 386 machines. And thus begins Cyrix's sudden and brief rise to the top. In the late 80s and early 90s, Cyrix's floating point units, also known as math coprocessors, were the cream of the crop. They used certain sophisticated hardware accelerated methods that seemed to prove better than Intel's methods and were able to capture a market that was somewhat niche but interesting. They were able to breach into CAD, science, sophisticated design, Excel tabulation, really anything that required complex math and yet most end users probably wouldn't care because that wasn't their market. What's their market? Well, it's yours and mine today. CPUs, RAM, graphics cards, the things that most of us care about because they're what we interact with, they're what we use on the daily. But Cyrix, well, they were focusing on a relatively niche market and doing it well, but they were a fabulous semiconductor. So they didn't actually produce anything on their own. Instead, they contracted out to vendors like SGS Thompson, Texas Instruments, and eventually Big Blue itself, IBM. Briefly, on the dominance of Cyrix as a company designing advanced math coprocessors, it's really important to highlight just how dominant they were. In fact, the Cyrix FastMath is, as one user discovered on Vogons by testing a number of other coprocessors as well as various revisions of the FastMath, in its quintessential form, probably the fastest math coprocessor for 386-based machines. Using a TI-486SXL with 8 kilobytes of level 1 cache, this user was able to determine, at least to my eyes, what seems to be a clear margin of victory for everything Cyrix-based. Certainly IIT and ULSI were impressive, but nonetheless, Cyrix was the only one that actually produced products that conformed to certain IEEE math standards, as well as the fact that Cyrix, unlike Intel, Cyrix's 387 couldn't run asynchronously from the processor. That is to say that a Cyrix 387 could not be run at a bus speed different from the Intel or AMD 386 that was powering the system. So let's take a look at a Cyrix FastMath CX83D87 at 40 megahertz. This model is meant for a 386DX and therefore speaks to the CPU on a purely 32-bit bus. Now what's interesting is this model is actually quite a late design and is in a quad flat package form mounted to a PGA68 adapter. All that means is that the flat thing on the top, yep, that's mounted to a converter that takes that and turns it to 68 little pins, each of which corresponds with a respective hole in a math coprocessor socket found on most 386 motherboards. Now the way you know in which this is oriented is based upon the little white dot at the top right hand corner. But Cyrix eventually moved on from math coprocessors. After all, there's only so much money to be made in what is a relatively niche market. Cyrix's next market was the desktop CPU market. Their intention was to branch out slowly but surely. Their first design was known as the CX486 SLC. It wasn't a 486, and it certainly wasn't what IBM would have called a super little chip for their SLC. It was kind of an interesting design, and as Redhill notes, it did introduce the idea of write-back cache in CPUs, at least as far as I know. That being said, 
performance was relatively poor and it was mostly designed as a replacement product or as a upgrade for antiquated or aging systems. However, various vendors found ways to squeeze these things onto motherboards where they probably didn't belong and sold essentially shoehorned products that were relatively disappointing in both performance and upgradability. And thus began Cyrix's marked rise to the top. Cyrix specialized in what most people would refer to as upgrade processors. Essentially, they were newer designs that worked on an older platform. Here, take for example, this Cyrix although it's TI labeled, because again, remember, TI was one of their manufacturers, this Cyrix 486 DLC. What is this device? Well, it's in PGA 132, which is the standard socket for a 386, and yet it's architecturally a bit upgraded. It's compatible with most 486 instructions, and it also includes one kilobyte of write back cache. Performance is pretty good. It's definitely pretty easy also to adapt. You just plug and play on most motherboards, and that was Cyrix's specialty. Weird products like that, that basically took an old motherboard or old system and pumped up performance to levels above the old system, but perhaps maybe a little less than the newer system. At 40 megahertz, these guys would compete roughly with a 486SX at 33, give or take. Perhaps even 25. It depended on the system overall, but for the most part, they were pretty amicable performers, and you could buy a system with a 486 DLC and more RAM at the same price as a system with an actual 486 and substantially less RAM. But Cyrix wasn't satisfied selling just upgrade chips, and then they decided to reverse engineer and improve Intel's 486 design. In 1994, IBM agreed to make chips for Cyrix, so IBM's microelectronics division became yet another supplier along with SGS Thompson and TI who were already Cyrix's existing suppliers. Interestingly, this is where things got sort of complicated in the market. Most people assumed that this was, and I quote, a nightmare for Intel, but they couldn't have been more wrong. Before we're going any further, I think it's important to digress and talk about an interesting relationship between Cyrix and TI. TI manufactures for Cyrix that 486 DLC that I showed earlier with one kilobyte of level one cache. What's interesting is TI actually irritated Cyrix because they produced a product known as the TI 486 SXL. The SXL contained a DLC core with eight kilobytes of level one cache equivalent to the standard Cyrix 486 that had already entered the market, at which point the 486 SXL stood to do some damage because it offered probably comparable performance. The reason I say probably is unfortunately I cannot test the one I have. And let me get to that. The one I have, as you see in this video, is in a 486 socket form, PGA 168. Weirdly, the 486 SXL, due to this disagreement, was limited to OEM use only, as you can see clearly marked on the chip. For the most part, it seemed to be, at least on paper, an interesting idea. And there were even clock doubled versions released. There was an SXL2 at 66 MHz. Before going any further, I'd like to mention one of the greatest and most short lived of the Cyrix products the Cyrix 5X86. Now most people who are into 486 machines are fans of the AMD 5x86, which is not a 5x86. It's a 486 that runs at 133 MHz and it's clock quadrupled. It's an interesting product and certainly a compelling one due to its strong integer performance. However, the Cyrix 5x86 is actually substantially faster and rarer. Based on the Cyrix M1 core, the Cyrix 5x86 used a scaled down version of the yet unreleased Cyrix 6x86. It had 50% of the transistors, but provided close to 70 to 80% of the performance depending on the scenario. Now obviously the 486 bus was somewhat crippled by its 32-bit memory access, which at that point was relatively antiquated, but the Cyrix 5x86 nevertheless remains a compelling option due to its extremely strong floating point and integer performance relative to other CPUs of the time. In fact, it was produced in 80, 100, 120, and 133 MHz variants. Now, the 133 MHz Cyrix 5x86 is basically an unknown. Nobody's been able to actually find one. However, the Cyrix 5x86 at 100 and 120 MHz are 
uncommon, but they do show up, with the 100 megahertz model being the most common. A user at Vogons, the same user from before, actually managed to figure out that if you want to overclock a Cyrix 5x86 to 133, you can. Even though they're known as relatively poor overclockers, there was a certain variant, the IBM 5x86C, which can be run at a 66 MHz bus on a 46, which, when clock doubled, yields 133 MHz. Performance is actually outstanding. It's certainly not a true Pentium per se, but it's faster than a Pentium 75 and even a Pentium 90, because those are the equivalents for a 5x86 at 100 and 120, respectively. And thus began Cyrix's dramatic rise to the top. The 5x86 and 6x86 marked some really interesting competition for both Intel and AMD. While AMD was struggling to develop its K5 and move into the fifth generation, Intel had already established the Pentium and at that point the Pentium Pro as viable fifth and sort of sixth generation options. The Cyrix 5x86 was sort of an in-between of a 486 and a Pentium. But the Cyrix 686, well, it was it was an interesting option. It wasn't entirely Pentium compatible due to it having certain issues in the microcode that rendered it effectively to identify as a 486 in certain programs. But for the most part, it was 90 to 99 percent compatible. Performance just continued to increase with die shrinks and continued development and design. And at that point, the Cyrix design team moved from the 6x86 to the 6x86L. The L was a lower voltage variant, and it only required a V-core of 2.8 volts. It produced substantially less heat, which was the one main knock against the Cyrix 6x86s. And it led to the development of the 6x86MX, which was known as the M2. The Cyrix M2 is the 6x86. It's a common sort of confusion because both products were sold under both names, but they are both identical at their core. Literally. Get it? At their core? Haha. -ha. But Cyrix, as they were developing these processors, also moved into trying to sell desktop computers to the high end. They developed their own, contracted out through a series of different companies, and attempted to sell to end users Cyrix branded PCs that were assured to have greater performance than their Intel or AMD counterparts. And at that time, AMD was pretty much non existent. Your options were an Intel Pentium or waiting for whenever the K5 would show up. When it did, it was a great processor. But until then, your options were pretty limited. But you can only fly high for so long. Cyrix was eventually doomed to meet its maker when the small company went to bat against Intel. Intel and Cyrix were tied up in extensive litigation that ended in settlements, but left Cyrix ultimately cash-strapped. In 1997, National Semiconductor agreed to acquire what was left, I would say, of Cyrix. Granted, it was still the same company, but the reason I say what was left is because what came next. Cyrix was working on, at the time, the Media GX. It was a unique design for its time. It used a 5x86 core, yes, that 5x86. So it is a 486 at heart, with an integrated sound and integrated graphics chip. The integrated sound chip is actually Sound Blaster 16 compatible, believe it or not. And its compatibility is halfway decent. Um, in fact, it's decent enough to the point where Creative sued Cyrix. Now, on the other hand, the graphics, well, they leave a lot to be desired, but they're certainly more than functional. That's actually what I want to talk about today. What I'm here to do is, at this point, explore the Media GX. What was it? What happened? And why did it ultimately end up killing Cyrix? You know, a lot of people say that Quake was the game that single-handedly ended Cyrix as a company. The truth is, it's sort of in between. It was both Quake and the Media GX. Cyrix went from being a high-performance desktop part maker to a lower-budget system-on-a-chip maker. Not a good shift for a company that was previously kicking Intel's butt and taking names. At that point in their history, Cyrix was also starting to struggle with floating-point math performance. Uh, Cyrix's FPUs hadn't really been improved too much since the 386 and 486 generations, and ironically, the company that was once at the cream of the crop, well, they were at the bottom of the barrel. At that point, well, there was not much to do to save them when Quake, a game that required a strong FPU, came out. When Quake was released, Cyrix 6x86s were essentially still the fastest option for high-performance integer-based math, but Quake, well, Quake didn't require integer-based math. 
it required a pipeline design in the floating point unit, which the Pentium had, and it used Pentium specific instructions. That meant that AMD K6s and K5s, they were going to struggle. And the 6x86 with its really antiquated FPU, yeah, poor thing, didn't stand a chance. Between that and Cyrix's money issues, their fate seemed all but sealed. The Media GX, though, could have been a savior, but was it? And now let's take a look at my Media GX system. I use an ECS P5 GXM. It's probably what you would call the Cadillac of Media GX motherboards. It provides nice voltage increments on a jumper block and a couple of different speeds, some interesting configuration options, but I'll get to that. What's most compelling is it provides two PCI slots and two ISA slots, as well as takes standard SD RAM, PC133 sticks, and everything about it's pretty bog standard. It even uses a socket 7 zero insertion for socket for the CPU, or system on a chip, whatever you want to call it. It uses an ATX layout, so modern power supplies are usable, like the Corsair TX750 I have in mine, and for the most part, it's nothing out of the ordinary. The only weird things are, well, First of all, as you notice by now, I'm using a National Semiconductor Geode. That is the Cyrix Media GX as produced by National Semi after the two companies merged. So again, it is a 5x86, but it just shares the socket and layout with a Pentium, and it competes in the same performance class. Sort of. Not really. Um, I have in the system a 3DFX Voodoo 1, which is just a standard 4 megabyte card. I have a standard 10100 LAN card, and I'm also just going to drop in so you can see a ISA Yamaha OPL3 sound card. It's actually an OPL3 SAX with a Dream Blaster S2 MIDI daughter board. It gives pretty good sound flexibility if you don't feel like using the internal Sound Blaster 16, which I'll show you why you, you may or may not want to use such a device. So, let's power it up and see what this is all about. Upon first boot, here's some interesting things you may have noticed. When I'm showing the BIOS settings here, it actually is configurable completely for Sound Blaster 16 as well as having onboard MIDI. You can change the amount of shared RAM between 2.5 and 1.5 and and megs, and uses a standard BIOS. Interestingly, in DOS, it identifies perfectly as a Media GXM at 267, 266 is what it should be, megahertz, and its performance metrics are not great. It has the typical weak Cyrix floating point unit, which, yes, for a Pentium class machine is awful considering it's using the 5x86's floating point unit, which is basically bog standard and compatible with any other 486 but not box standard for the time. Um, its MMX implementation is relatively garbage, and it's not a particularly compelling system on first glance. Let's install Windows 98 and see where we go. Windows 98 install, well, it's relatively just normal. The only thing is to note that I had NT4 on here previously, so that's why you get that message. But let's get that going and get some games going, because I think that's what we all want to see. But first, you should just know that when you install the Media GX certified drivers, they come from a file called mediagx.exe, and standard driver install, and once they're run, sound works perfectly. And that's the inboard sound that you're hearing, and it's pretty dang good. Anyway, let's get to some games, because that's what everyone's here for, right? Now let's take a listen to what the system can do when you have a Dream Blaster S2 and an actual OPL3 and the OPL3 SAX, which is Sound Blaster Pro compatible. <laughs> 
performance in Duke 3D at 800 by 600 is decent. It's not great, but it's better than you'd expect. It runs pretty smooth. It's better than running it on a standard 486, and this is all in the inboard graphics. And when you take a listen to it with the OPL3 clone that's built into the system for the Sound Blaster 16 emulation or Sound Blaster 16 compatible, it's actually pretty good. There's probably a few hits and misses on the OPL3 sound, but overall the FM synthesis is not bad. I'd rate it as probably a solid 7 or 8 out of 10, with the Yamaha OPL3 being the gold standard at a obviously 11 out of 10, because everyone loves OPL3, right? And now we'll take a listen to Tyrion and Descent. Tyrion is perhaps one of the best examples of FM synthesis, and it provides an interesting but quite weird implementation when combined with the Media GX's integrated Sound Blaster 16. Well, Sound Blaster 16 compatible. When you activate the Sound Blaster sound effects, do note that the typical problems with the Tyrion drivers for sound occur, and you get some weird crackling and buzzing and the OPL3 just almost sort of ceases to work. As far as Descent goes, I would ask that you pay close attention to the OPL2 sounds. OPL2 seems really strange on here, and the OPL3 seems to have some skips and errors. Whether or not this can be fixed by loosening memory timings, I'm not sure, but I believe it might be able to, so just keep that in mind if you're interested in this system. Zero, zero, zero. 
take a look at Duke 3D as well as Doom on the Cyrix's integrated sound. Do note that the Cyrix Media GX is actually capable of emulating a PC speaker, so it can output the PC speaker sounds through a 3.5mm jack, just like standard PCM or AdLib audio. Come get some. Hail to the king, baby. Okay, okay, you got me. I know the system seems like it's pretty solid other than a few little hiccups with the integrated sound and the integrated graphics being not great, but there are other issues. First of all, I could not get a Gravis ultrasound working in here. 
immediately noticed some odd screeches and cracks and pops and just an overall inability to play anything with a high DMA. It seems to me that this system has weird high DMA issues, and part of that just has to do with how the system handles what are called non-maskable interrupts. To not get too technical, all that's really interesting is the Media GX actually can do non-maskable interrupts, however you have to do some weird sort of CPU bit flipping using specific CPU registry editing software, and editing the CPU register is a little bit intense because it can lock up your system and whatnot, so I don't recommend tinkering with it unless you're really that interested in getting a GUS working, which quite frankly not sure whether or not you can or you can't. The other thing is this only takes double-sided low-density SD RAM. Not a big deal, but I usually use a 192 megs because I can run that at CL2 and run it with a clock divisor of 3, so that would be 266 over 3, which is roughly 80 something megahertz. I believe 89, 88. But that's not what any of us are here for. None of this. We all want to see one thing, and that's a Cyrix processor versus its mortal nemesis. In 1997, that was Quake. So I bring you Software Quake at 640 by 480 on the Media GX. Pretty bad, right? Well, that's why I bring you GL Quake on the Voodoo 1 and the Media GX. Note that nothing has been changed, this is just running on the 3DFX Voodoo 1. Ah! <laughs> 
So here's the deal. It looks like the Media GX at 266 with the 33 megahertz bus is about the same as a Pentium 133 in terms of integer math and somewhere around like a Pentium 100 or Pentium 90 in floating point math. It's not awful, but it's not totally usable. The big thing is the system is great for 486 DOS gaming, for early 3D games, for just kind of like that retro era that normally you need a 486 to capture. The thing is, the Media GX is much cheaper than buying a flat out 486 and it's much easier to work with. It's micro ATX on most of the boards, standard stuff, I mean, for the most part. After all, when you consider the fact that we're working with a micro ATX motherboard in a modern case with really just basically retro components of random sorts, you know, ISA cards, PCI cards, for the most part, it's a pretty nice system because you don't have to go out of your way to get an AT case, you don't have to get any adapters, you don't have to tinker with any voltages, there's no negative 5 volt rail to worry about. The main thing here is it's a really adaptable system and it's quite unique, you know, it's, it's something cool, it's different. Substantially cheaper than buying a 486 too. The system is basically, all in all, somewhere around like 65, 70 bucks when you consider it all in versus when you're talking about a 486, you're looking at three, four times the cost these days. So, you know, Media GX overall, is it the product that killed Cyrix? Yes. Is it a terrible product in retrospect? Probably not. Does it have its quirks and issues? Certainly. But as a first gen SOC, it's really impressive at what it was able to do and impressive how far we've come. So I leave you with this. Cyrix at one point was the fastest when it came to floating point math. Obviously, their floating point math was part of their undoing, not all of it. Their money troubles from the litigation that ensued with Intel certainly are problematic and uh, amongst other management issues and whatnot, the company itself was just not destined to last too long. But here's the thing. These days, we're looking at Intel and AMD. That's it. VIA doesn't produce anything as far as the x86 infrastructure is concerned that's worthwhile or even accessible. And if you really want a third-party high-performance chip, there is no one. So, you know, wouldn't it be great if someone could come along like Cyrix and produce upgrade chips, produce their own kind of neat chips, and then eventually move into the high-end market? Hey, who knows, maybe one day it'll happen. But one thing's for sure now, Cyrix certainly had a storied history and it's not often talked about. And you know, I just wanted to say that uh, it's one of those stories that's sort of sad, sort of interesting, but overall it was a David versus Goliath. For a while it seemed like Cyrix was gonna win, that they were gonna be able to take some market share from Intel and AMD and do some real damage. And indeed they did, but the truth is nothing lasts forever and times change and technologies change. And when you can't keep up with the times, you know, especially in tech, that's how these things work. Thanks for tuning in and checking out this video. I hope you were able to appreciate some of the things that we talked about and some of the things we explored and look forward to exploring more and learning more and sharing more along the way. For now, that'll be all and you know, I'd appreciate it if you drop a like if you enjoyed the video and subscribe to the channel if you want to see more.